Delmarva Today with Don Rush. The fight to unseat Eastern Shore Republican Congressman Andy Harris is on, and Democrat Heather Mazier appears to lead the Democratic PAC. Welcome to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. Served for eight years in the Maryland House of Delegates, leaving electoral politics behind after losing her bid, the 2014 Democratic gubernatorial primary. But with Congressman Harris's reaction to the defeat of Donald Trump and the January insurrection at the nation's capital, she says she made the decision to challenge him. Already she has raised over a million dollars and has scooped up a number of major endorsements, including that of Maryland Senator Chris Van Hollen and Congressman Jamie Raskin. Run also coincides at a time when Maryland lawmakers will be redrawing congressional district lines, potentially making the first congressional district more competitive. And we have her on the phone, or rather in the studio this morning. Welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me, Don. So, um, well, I'll just get to the quick business about um, the congressional redistricting. Uh, apparently, the congressman says that he might run in another district if it is redrawn. Uh, what's your reaction to that and um, the idea that they might draw the district so there will be no Republicans in the Congress from this state. I saw the news article that covered that suggestion that he might run in another district. And my first thought was, I think he's running to another district. He's running away because he's scared. Um, I think it's a head fake. Uh, all the other districts are much more solidly Democratic than ours. He's beating his chest over his frustration that the lines are being redrawn. But where the legislature is looking to go in the special session that votes on the congressional maps the week of, of December 6th is um, to make the district more fair and balanced. And it appears, based on the vote that the Legislative Redistricting Advisory Committee took with, that is made up of the Senate President and the Speaker of the House and a few other members of the legislature, that had a very involved, uh, transparent process for citizen engagement and testimony. They chose a map that um, takes the first district technically into a category of a toss-up seat, uh, making it a 50-50 district and may the best candidate win. So you would certainly benefit from this redistricting. Um, in terms of fairness, you've talked about <laughs> fairness. If this redistricting is done in such a way that there are no Republicans who are able to, say, get into Congress from this state, and let's say, for instance, you beat him. You've talked about fairness, <laughs> but is it really fair? I mean, if the result is the fact that there are Republicans are not represented at all. Well, some would suggest the data shows Maryland being so strongly a Democratic state that all eight seats could be drawn without uh, creative map making to have all eight seats be Democratic. I think having um, one seat on the shore that has tra has traditionally sometimes been represented by a Republican, sometimes been represented by a Democrat, for uh, how can you get any more fair and balanced than 50-50? I want to turn, by the way, to the Supreme Court, uh, which heard arguments over um, an abortion case, the uh, Mississippi case, limiting uh, abortion to 15 weeks. What do you make of that? We have the Texas case that's going to be coming down the road, which is like six weeks, besides how it's enforced. Where do you think this is going? And do you think there's ever going to be an, the ability to have Congress pass some kind of codified row? Well, the House of Representatives recently did. The Women's Health Protection Act that Andy Harris voted against would codify Roe. It's pending in the Senate. Thankfully, it it was passed over his objection, and we're waiting for the Senate to move on it. Um, ideally, uh, we hope that the Supreme Court will uphold um, what has been the interpretation uh, that we've been living under from Roe v. Wade for some time and that uh, a substantial near supermajority of Americans agree with. But if they don't, there is legislative recourse. And I think that Roe needs to be codified in federal law. I think the question becomes, is it possible, given the fact that the Senate anyway has a filibuster rule, which is not just simply a majority, even if you are in the majority, but requires that that uh, 60 vote uh, in order to approve it. I mean, it does it seems like a long stretch between here and and getting any kind of legislation at all. Well, I think the the operative word used there is the Senate rule on filibuster. It's uh, the filibuster is not something that's part of our constitution. It's an agreed upon set of uh, rules that the Senate comes up 
uh, with. And there's been conversation for a while now on whether or not that needs to um, shift. And I think that when you've got issues like um, women's reproductive rights and voting rights on the line the way they are, having a conversation about taking another look at what those rules are is is something that, that needs to be taken up in the Senate. You, you had Joe Manchin and uh, Cinema was saying no, just a couple of saying no, we're not going to do it. I mean, it sounds like... It's, it's just not okay for a majority of the country to be represented by voices in the Senate and having two people hold it up. Yeah. Um, we're, we're, we're quickly moving to a place where there's a minority rule within the way these institutions and, and the partisan bickering ha- is taking place. Now, I'm somebody who absolutely supports building consensus and working consistently to transcend partisanship and ideology to come up with the best solution. But that's not often what's happening in Washington anymore, and particularly in the Senate where there's been deadlock. It, it, it often has come down to uh, fights over um, control and power that um, I'd like to, to see there be more of a, a desire to get things done again. I want to turn to the, the pandemic, which is the other thing hanging over all of us. Uh, we now have the Omicron variant that uh, looks as if it's now come to the United States. We're not sure exactly whether it is necessarily more transmissible or more virulent for that matter. Where are you on combating this pandemic, particularly with the issue of things like masks and vaccinations? And are you f- in favor of mandatory vaccinations and masks? You know, I think... Um we are in a, an unprecedented, um, well, unprecedented for us. You know, our, our ancestors, you know, every hundred years, this seems to happen. And I don't know why we thought it wasn't going to happen to us. Um, here we are living through this moment the best we can with the benefits of modern science and technology. I'm so thankful for the science breakthroughs that have um, provided us the the vaccines. I'm vaccinated. Um, I encourage everyone to do to do so. We um, it's it's a it's a, a social uh, compact that we are in. Um, you you remember going to elementary school? The vaccination card that you had to prove how many vaccinations that you had in order to go to school for a whole host of. Um, uh, ailments and illnesses that we've been able to tackle and combat through that kind of robust vaccine strategy, adding um, a a requirement that we be vaccinated for COVID is is no different than how we have been engaging as a society for quite some time. For some weird reason, politics has gotten inserted in this one in in a weird way, and I'm hoping over time we can untangle that and come back to a a good place of of understanding that um, we we're all in it together. Do, do you favor the mandatory of uh, vaccinations? Yes. And do you favor mandatory wearing of masks, particularly in schools? Yes. So, what do you say to to parents who say we don't we don't want that? We don't. We think our liberties have been, are being violated. That we don't want our children for whatever reasons. Some of them believe that they might actually be get more sick. What do you say to them? Because it's it's not an unprevalent um, opinion here on the shore. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's every good every policy issue is important to be able to have all sides being heard. At the end of the day, policymakers and school boards have to make a decision about what's best for the overall health for um, a population, for, for the overall population. Um, and so there's recourse. Um, there are some families that are choosing to homeschool their children rather than have them wear a mask in the schools. Um, everyone has the right to, to make a decision on what's best for their family in that way. But in, in making a decision for what is right for all of the children within the school, I think we have a very clear indication of, of what science is suggesting is the best social approach for how we interact with each other. By the way, finally, on the subject, are you in favor of um, mandatory masks but, uh, there, or vaccination for that matter? But in, for instance, in the Biden administration's rule, there is an, ex, there is an alternative, which is testing. Yes. So, so, yes. so, I mean, so it's not an absolute 
um, mandatory uh, vaccination. You have been in favor of the of the testing as an alternative, and how effective yes. do you think that is? That's going to be. Well, we're we're finding it more. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. I presumed it, that within the question sure. you were speaking of it in in that framework. Yeah. Um, the we're finding the availability of tests um, and the cost of of tests to be um, more affordable, available, and and more accurate the longer we are living with this pandemic. I want to turn to um, agriculture because one of the issues has been to try to clean up the, the bay. I think I saw in one of your um, st- issue statements that you see agriculture as one of the primary uh, polluters of the bay. Now, I've talked to a number of, of farmers who say they, they, they're not the cause or they're, I think at one point was said that uh, they're being accused of a crime they didn't commit, Right. What, how do you cross the T's and dot the I's in terms of ensuring that poultry particularly, but also farming in general, is compatible with uh, the, the Chesapeake Bay? Because there are a lot of farmers who say, we're not the problem here. No, I, I, I have not ever suggested they are, they are the problem. Um, I actually see farmers as the solution to our challenges. Um, just this week, we rolled out a... Um, we launched a Farmers for Mazir group, and within that released a plan that we'd been working on. I love to bring stakeholders together and find best practices and consensus approach towards problem solving. And we have a, a really great plan that, that we call Agriclimate Solutions for Maryland's Eastern Shore. And it's focused on what are some of the agricultural policies that we can implement that are a net positive for the environment. So that we're coming at this conversation from a place of how do we bring more incentives and technical support and engagement to farmers uh, in a way that with what programs we're proposing are going to be helpful to the climate crisis. Specifically related to the um, chicken litter, um, just today I was visiting a facility in the lower shore at uh, a farm in Pocomoke um, where Planet Energy, uh, Planet Found Energy mm-hmm. Development I- exists. There's a research and development operation on a farm there that is showing really great promise in technology that will take chicken litter and through an anaerobic digestion process uh, and a closed hydraulic loop, uh, turn the chicken manure into um, net positive benefits like potting soil, um, phosphorus that's pulled out instead of applied to the fields. and methane gas that they are able to capture and then convert to alternative energy. And it's a a really great win-win-win approach. They started out as a pilot concept and they got state money to invest in their pilot. And then they've grown the pilot into a larger research and development facility. And they now stand on the precipice of an opportunity to grow it into a commercial size practice that could take as much as 30,000 tons of the chicken litter um, away from the process so that it's not uh, having the unintended impact on our Chesapeake Bay and and, um, watershed area. I talk about this process and this um, promising technology as one of the component parts of this plan. And through the Biden administration's infrastructure bill that just passed, in addition to a whole host of things that are great for our state and our region in particular, there's $250 million dedicated specifically for innovative approaches to cleaning up um, the Chesapeake Bay. And so technologies like this can compete for and hopefully qualify for ex- for additional funds that will help them scale up. Uh, it'll create jobs uh, and it will create um, products that are a net positive rather than a detraction to um, in helping us solve this problem. I want to turn to the waterman real quickly. And that is, of course, um, there's, I guess, a, a bit of a dust up, I think, with uh, um, Comptoir Peter French, who was running for governor, who was suggesting that there be some emphasis on aquaculture as opposed to necessarily the wild oyster harvesting. Where are you on that? And uh, what kind of role do you see 
and this is obviously with the federal government and in that sort of activity and just sort of cleaning up the bay in general. Mm-hmm. I uh, I do not agree with Peter Francho in his approach on this. Um, I do support growing aquaculture. We do need to have both, though. The wild harvesting isn't part of the problem. You need to have wild harvesting. Um, Oysters themselves will suffocate if there's not an ongoing effort to um, do harvesting. But we we do need more oysters in the bay to help with um, cleaning the bay. Um, But... Part of what we need to do to do that is cleaning up the waterways that create more opportunities for places that we can grow and for them to return in in the wild. So we have to keep the focus first on keeping our waterways clean and um, and listening and partnering with the watermen and in the same approach that I take with the with the farmers. We have to stop coming at policy from a place where we only look at it from an academic perspective and leaving out the voices of those who are closest to the land, the water, who are doing the work, and having that inform the larger decisions that, that we make. These livelihoods are on the line here, and the, the watermen themselves support oysters and the bay. like They want it as clean as the rest of us do. Stop looking at them as the problem and instead part of the solution. And just, just briefly, uh, if you were in Congress, would you put some pressure on your colleagues from Pennsylvania because one of the issues has been the Conowingo lot- Dam? Yes. Absolutely. Um, we're receiving way too much sediment coming at us from other places, and our environmental records and our PSC here in Maryland has been much better at staying on top of those aspects than what um, our partners in, in Pennsylvania have done. And, and absolutely, I think we need to have a regional approach. Where are you, by the way, on uh, funding or allowing anyway um, offshore wind farms? Um, in Ocean City, for instance, there's some concern about its impact on on tourism. Um, it doesn't look as if these things are going to be pushed out any further just because of the technological issues. What do you say to some of the folks in Ocean City who say, you know, we don't want this here? And, and, and as a congressman, is there anything you can do to, mil- to ameliorate that? I think that we need to engage and participate in the clean energy economy. There are important jobs that are being created. Uh, when Maryland set out the goal for creating offshore wind a decade ago, it put us ahead of the curve in being able to attract businesses and industry for um, important job creation. You know, right here on the shore in Caroline County, um, we have. Uh, Crystal Fabricators just got $70 million to start working on creating jobs for building um, the blades for for the turbines. Um, U.S. Wind and uh, Orsted are partnering and working with um, local areas for important job creation. It's good for the economy. It's good for alternative energy. It needs to be implemented in a way where, you know, Johnny Hahn's pots don't need to be messed with, and we have to be really um, on top of having the conversation of how do we build these in a way that isn't impacting um, the watermen on 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 the uh, on the ocean there. Um, but I, I I continue to believe that 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 is possible for those who are opposed to it because they don't like the way it looks or for any number of other reasons. I'm just going to have to agree to disagree with them on that. I think this is important for um, where we're headed in a a green future economy and where Maryland can play a role in once we've built these and, and put the expertise in place for our state, it sets us up in line as this starts to get replicated up and down the mid-Atlantic for us to be creating those jobs for, for um, the work that will happen in other states as well. The Eastern Shore is a socially conservative area. Uh, I ran across a map uh, just a few minutes ago uh, looking at, I think it was a revision of the, uh, of the abortion um, uh, measures here in the state of Maryland. And when I looked at, for instance, the Eastern Shore, there was either opposition to the, to to easing those, to expanding those, or a very, very lukewarm um, support. What do you say to socially conservative folks who, who say, oppose abortion or who want to see more religious um uh, activities within schools and so on and so forth. They, they look around at their, at their country and they see it changing. What do you say to them? 
I say to them the, the same conversation I had with a colleague of mine in the General Assembly where I proposed that he and I could work together to lower the abortion rate in Maryland because we share that goal. And when I proposed this to f- f- then now also former delegate um, Mike Schmeagel, uh, conservative Republican from Cecil County, um, pro-life, and I said, you know, Mike, you and I want the same thing. We want to eliminate abortions. But the way we do it, the way we can come together and do it is to get rid of unwanted pregnancies. And how we do that is to put free family planning services in the hands of all low-income women so that they can be empowered to have babies when it makes sense to them. And I'd come to this conversation armed with data from the Alan Guttmacher Institute that showed we could lower the abortion rate by 3,000 a year by making this policy change. And oh, by the way, it was also good for our state budget because the federal government was going to give us an enhanced matching rate for this policy proposal. And we'd have the added benefit of improving infant mortality rates. When mothers are um, engaged through the family planning process, they are having babies, um, they're having planned pregnancies that have really good in- outcomes for babies. And we have to be as focused on caring for the children after they're born. And and this was a, a, a policy that I'm really proud that he and I were able to pass together. Even though as, as a congresswoman, um, you certainly, if the convocation of Roe came up, you would be voting for it. Mm-hmm. So on the one hand, you can say, I, we want to take care of these children, find alternatives, as you did in the state legislature. But there is this sharp dividing line between that and, uh, well, I want to, I, I oppose abortion or I want severe restrictions on it. I mean, there is this, and I don't want to get hung up too much in the abortion issue, but mm-hmm. it, generally speaking, that there is this cultural thing that, that we have here. Well, if someone is opposed to having an abortion, they don't, they have the choice not to have an abortion. Right. And, uh, but they don't want other people to have it. I mean, that's, you know what I'm saying? Um. Let me just turn uh, foreign policy. Um, we've got a number of issues. Uh, one of them, of course, is uh, we have this issue about immigration at the border. Hey, Where can I you... ask you a quick question? Sure. Are we going to talk at all about the campaign? Yes, we'll talk a bit about the campaign. Okay, but, because... but I want to get down the issue. Because <laughs> right. I'm not a member of Congress quite yet. <laughs> well, but you might be. <laughs> Uh, immigration. Um, where are you with that? Um, we have some situations where I guess they're trying to figure out what they're going to do. What What's your sense about that? Um, we have to um, continue to work towards a path towards citizenship for the people who are here. We need uh, to strike that balance along with um, protecting our border. And um, good people ac- across the aisle um, have come together to f- work on proposals um, it's just gotten mired up in politics and I want to see us get back to a place in Congress where policy is driving our decisions and coming together to find solutions to these problems are are um, what motivates us and not scoring political points or pointing fingers at each other Finally, on foreign policy what, what role do you see the US playing in in the world today we have competition obviously with China we got stuck in a couple of wars I don't know where you were about that in Afghanistan and Iraq um, China's a competitive what 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 do you see I mean what role do you, how do you define whether, whether we intervene or not intervene what what is do you see? How much more time do we have here, Don? <laughs> that's a big, just, just a few that's a big, that's a big can of worms right there. Um, uh, I think that you know these these decisions aren't made in a vacuum, and they aren't made entirely by you know one member of Congress. Sure. Um, I appreciate very much um, where um, President Biden. Uh, the history he has had, you know, he he chaired the Foreign Relations Committee for so many years, uh, was vice president under um, President Obama. Um, I tend to take his lead on a lot of these issues on, you know, the withdrawal in Afghanistan. I think all of us, hindsight's always twenty twenty. Um, I don't think anyone anticipated the collapse happening as quickly as it did. And so it it definitely came across as um, quite a catastrophic execution of what was probably the right choice, though. We've been saying for, uh, you know, 20 years now that this was a war we needed to 
remove ourselves from, that it was an unwinnable war. And we were sending our soldiers over there to um, die on a mission that um, was unwinnable and that many of them were very um, poetically speaking to the need to to withdraw. So um, while I also wish that it had happened differently, I think that he made the right call. And as a freshman legislator who's going to be, you know, learning more than just being uh, a bystander with opinions, I will take the lead from uh, statesmen like President Biden, but also my my former boss, John Kerry. Um, I was his domestic policy director for four years. Notice I said domestic policy director. However, uh, there's there are a few people I respect more in terms of, of a brilliant foreign strategic mind than John Kerry. He continues to be a good friend of mine, and he would be the person I would pick up the phone to talk to if I ever came to a place where I was struggling with a decision about what we should do on our on our foreign policy. Let me just turn to right. We're talking about the campaign. Uh, so you raised over a million dollars is what I read. Um, you seem to be running certainly ahead of, of uh, I guess, Dave Harden, I think is also running. Um, you've picked up, as I indicate, some endorsements from uh, Chris Van Hollen, Anthony Brown, Jamie Raskin, and so on, Wayne Gilchrist. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you, where do you see the campaign and, and how, I, mean, I think you've been quoted as saying that money is energy and enthusiasm. Mm-hmm. What, <laughs> tell me a bit about, <laughs> and, I mean, and what, what do you think is going to make this campaign different than, say, some of the ones, previous ones that we've seen, mm-hmm. uh, particularly against Harris? Well, I, th- I thank you for pointing to all those endorsements. We can't leave out some of the key um, local endorsements, too, sure. since we're here on the Lower Shore. Um, right here in Salisbury, Mayor Jake Day, uh, Councilwoman Michelle Gregory and Angela Blake, um, Wicomico County Councilman Bill um, McCain. I'm really um, excited to be working with um, all of these local elected officials and my colleagues at the federal level um, to bring back uh, bold, fearless, and dignified leadership again. Um, Andy Harris and I disagree on a lot of policy issues. There's no question about that. Um, and you're right at the head of the show. You said it was the events of January 6th that called me back into service. Um, but underlying so much of this is about good governance and um, basic representation that he just misses the mark on. He doesn't even put in requests for us on things like infrastructure um, bills. Uh, um, We, in the, in the over 10 years that Andy Harris has been in the Congress, he's passed one bill and it's to name a post office. Um, That's not the kind of representation I will bring. I am an activist legislator. I like to put detailed policy plans together and then know how to take them from ideas into action and get them implemented. And so the the energy and enthusiasm that this campaign is building is multi-layered. People are equally excited about defeating Andy Harris and electing Heather Mazier. That's what I mean by money being energy. In the absence of being able to vote right now, um, what you can do is vote with your contributions. And the the money that has come into our campaign has been drawn to us because of the energy of, of the campaign that we're running. And it's not just on the issues or on my legislative record, all of these things that excite people about my, my history of getting things done and the ideas on what I'd like to get done when I'm there. We bring a, a really unique um, heart-centered approach to campaigning that I am thrilled is, is resonating so deeply. In September, we launched a group within our campaign that we call the Mazir Volunteer Corps. And our focus with the Missouri Volunteer Corps is the idea that you don't have to wait to win an election to make a difference now. We are partnering with nonprofit organizations and, and charities throughout the first district to do community service projects with that energy and enthusiasm of our grassroots army. And so as a result, we've been here in Salisbury working at the Maryland Food Bank sorting food products. We were in Cambridge in Dorchester County rebuilding oyster barrier reefs for habitat restoration in the chop tank. We partnered with um, 
uh, partners in care in um, Talbot County to help with some uh, senior citizens with independent living with some projects in their home. Passing out turkeys with Maneri's Dream Alliance for the holiday season in, in Chestertown. Next, on the on December 11th, we'll be um, in Caroline County at, um, at Grace Hope Food Pantry. Week after, you know, consistently, a couple of times a month, over and over, showing up in the community and giving this message that you don't even have to support me in order to come and participate in these projects. Let's come together, rise above the chaos, the dissension, the division, and f- connect with each other again on how we can make a difference in our communities. Be showing up for each other, with each other, and the campaign is a, a way to show a path towards an opportunity to do that. Not just about electing me, but how can we get some good done now? And I think uh, my philosophy has always been that the way you campaign is the way that you're going to govern. And this is just one aspect of how I'd like to see us grow that kind of community engagement um, for as long as I'm honored to be able to represent the first district. Finally, what do you make of where our country is at this point? We've touched on some of the issues and some of the conflicts, but we seem to be living through some very tumultuous times, perhaps Mm -hmm. even um, an inflection point in our democracy. What what sense do you get? And what would you tell other people about where we are? Mm. We are at a very critical moment. I'd been encouraged to run against Andy Harris for years that I have been living on the Eastern Shore. And I never entertained it seriously um, on the basis alone of us having a disagreement over policy issues. But the fact that our the core of our democracy itself is being attacked is something that is very deeply resonant for me. And I remind people throughout this campaign that And this is one of the exciting things about the district being competitive. I wish all the districts were more competitive because that's where democracy is alive. Democracy, this whole notion of we the people, it's a fluid experiment. It moves, it changes, it's reflecting the people and our opinions. But those need that will best be served when it's coming from a place of really truly engaging with each other, deep listening, bringing compassion and curiosity to a conversation again, being willing to sit down with someone you disagree with and not look to just find the next opportunity to insert your talking point about what you think because you want to jam your opinion down somebody else's throat, but really play with why do you think that way? And how is it that we can find overlapping areas of, of agreement? Um, coming back to the, um, the agricultural plan, the agroclimate plan we just released, um, some suggested that I was a magician for being able to hold together vastly disparate opinions on where policy should go like this and form consensus that Um, these stakeholders would all be willing to sign on to. Um, That's just how good governance happens. And it's also the foundation of our country. Uh, We're set on a foundation of freedom, equality, justice, and humanity for which American patriots sacrifice their lives and fortunes. And it's incumbent upon each of us to understand the urgency of this moment and to be engaged, not just engaging to elect who you think, you know, one side or the other and which one's going to hold power, but to really open yourself to a deeper vulnerable place of connecting to each other again and having those difficult conversations with an open heart in order to um, remind us that that humanity piece. And if that's one of the impacts that this campaign and my candidacy and my form of leadership and representation can bring, which is a stabilization to the chaos and a path towards a deeper connection to each other so that we can um, find our way forward on both the big things and the small things, um, that will be a legacy that I will uh, go to the grave smiling with. 
We've been speaking with Heather Mazier. She is running to the Democrats uh, in the Democratic primary, hopefully to unseat the Eastern Shore Republican, Congressman Andy Harris. And we appreciate you taking the time to stop by and, and chatting about all of those issues. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it was uh, quite quite a, a, an array of topics we covered, but I, I appreciate it so much, Don. This has been Del Marva Today. I'm Don Rush. Thanks for listening. Delmarva Today with Don Rush.